I'm Camilla Jujvik and I'm a postdoc here at the Center for Brain, Minds and Machines. And, and it's my pleasure today to talk with Thomas Serra, uh, who is an uh, associate professor at Brown's University. So also Thomas did a PhD here with uh, Tommy Poggio and then stayed um, during his postdoc before joining Brown's. So to start with, could you tell us more about your scientific background and uh, your research interests in general? Sure. All my study was done in France. Uh, I studied math and, and physics as an undergrad, uh, then attended what uh, uh, are called the Grandes Écoles, one of the Grandes Écoles, which, is, uh, which are typically uh, graduate engineering schools. Uh, and. Um, while I was studying uh, engineering in, in France, I realized that I, uh, engineering was not uh, uh, probably not going to cut it for me. And I, uh, as I was uh, working with artificial neural network and working in image processing, I quickly fell in love with uh, biological neural networks. Uh, so I uh, looked for a place where I could uh, uh, come and uh, do my final internship for the for the school where you know a group where potentially people would be doing kind of solid mathematical work in uh, machine learning statistical learning theory uh, solid work on the engineering side of things getting you know computer vision applications out of that and then um, uh, solid neuroscience work on learning and, and vision and uh, and googling around or I guess back then uh, there was no Google so Alta Vista ing around uh, I, I found this uh, place at MIT, CBCL, the, which was uh, uh, the Center for Biological and Computational Learning, which was uh, Tommy Poggio's uh, group back then, and, uh, and realized that it felt like uh, an ideal place for me. So I, I applied for an internship, got it, uh, and uh, came here and just fell in love with the place um, and decided to stay. And so I applied for the PhD program in BCS, in Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Uh, I spent about a year, I think, uh, just working on computer vision with Tommy and a postdoc, Bern Heisele. Uh, uh, studied my PhD here in 2001. Uh, I was a graduate student from 2001 to 2006. Um, and then I was having too much fun to leave, so I decided to stay uh, for my postdoc. So uh, I spent another four years uh, as a postdoc here uh, and uh, studied at Brown in January 2010. At Browns, like how did you, what is your current research about and what you decided to work on after leaving MIT? Yeah, so you know, so my, my PhD uh, with Tommy was on uh, uh, essentially modeling, you know, uh, the fit forward processes uh, involved during uh, so called rapid visual categorization tasks, something that has been dear to Tommy for many years. Uh, I worked on uh, extending a, a model uh, known as HMAX, as the article mm -hmm. Max. Uh, which is kind of uh, 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 some type of an ancestor of our modern kind of deep convolutional neural networks. So that was essentially most of my uh, uh, work as a, as a graduate student. As a, as a postdoc, I was able to branch out. I did some uh, work that is very dear uh, for me uh, uh, with Bob Desimon, where we worked on attention. We built computational models of attention, understanding how attention and object recognition interact. Um, and then at Brown, it was, uh, you know, I had, you know, some kind of, a, I guess, some sort of an epiphany uh, because I'm in a cognitive, linguistic and psychological sciences mm -hmm. department where uh, there's a number of people studying vision uh, and, and very different aspects of vision way beyond uh, object recognition. People studying, you know, reaching and grasping, uh, the control of locomotory behavior, low level vision, high level vision. Uh, and, and, and certainly, you know, it occurred to me that, uh, you know, object recognition was, was too narrow of a mm. field. So I embarked on, on deciding to study vision <laughs> with a capital V. So we've done a number of studies. I'm, you know, still very much interested in, in, in uh, 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 vision, visual processing. Um, I, my long-term goal has been to uh, uh, build a, uh, 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 essentially, large-scale computational models of the visual system uh, towards uh, better understanding the brain mechanisms that guide our, our everyday visual uh, kind of processing tasks. Um, more recently, we've been focusing on um, uh, the role of feedback in our mm -hmm. visual system. Uh, we've been trying to understand how uh, uh, feedback acts on you know, visual cortex uh, 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 towards trying to build uh, kind of better, uh, smarter uh, uh, computer vision algorithms. 
Yeah, and you did um, a lot of work recently about recurrent and, and, and the importance of recurrent for different tasks with human soul. Mm -hmm. um, and could you tell us more, what do you think we really need recurrent for in the brain? Well, I think that's a one million dollar question. Um, uh, what do we need uh, recurrence for? Well, um, uh, you know, I think we know that there are tasks that potentially do not require recurrence. So uh, we were just talking about rapid categorization tasks, something mm -hmm. that you are very familiar with. But uh, presumably there is uh, uh, when we constrain visual processing to be fast uh, for things like image categorization. Uh, um, uh, people have been scientists have been working with this assumption that uh, uh, one way by which our visual system can speed itself to you know, its, its temporal limit is by allowing uh, uh, decisions to be made based on a single feedforward sweep of activity. And perhaps not surprising, the, still the dominant class of computational models of, of vision are uh, feedforward hierarchical models. Um, interestingly, uh, there is uh, probably as much if not more feedback uh, in our uh, visual system than there is feedforward connections, which raises the interesting question of what is uh, feedback for. And so while presumably for certain uh, 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 easy enough image categorization task, uh, feedforward processing, preattentive processing is probably sufficient, uh, under more severely degraded uh, uh, um, uh, visual conditions, perhaps under occlusion, under noisy condition, there is probably a need for, for feedback even in object recognition and indeed there is uh, recent work from uh, Jim DiCarlo's lab suggesting that this is indeed the case. But I think beyond object recognition there are many tasks that are you know not just image categorization. I think you know Shimon Ullman proposed a number of visual routines some uh, 30, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Uh, things like figuring out whether there is a path to go from one place to another. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, perceptual grouping, we know, you know, are, 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 are presumably under certain circumstances cannot be solved with purely feedforward uh, processing. And uh, there is neuroscience evidence that uh, horizontal connections uh, within, uh, 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 between neurons uh, uh, along different locations on the, on the, on the surface, on the, on the visual cortex, uh, as well as uh, top-down connections from higher onto lower visual areas uh, do play a role in, in some of those uh, uh, I, would, I would call those uh, more general visual reasoning tasks beyond just image categorization. So I would say, you know, most of vision uh, beyond this rapid categorization probably require uh, feedback mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And beyond feedback, what are other brain-inspired constraints that we should build in deep nets? Yeah, again, I think this is, you know, a million dollar question. Um, <clears throat> You know, to me, it's, it's fascinating to see how much uh, progress we've, we've made in, uh, you know, computer vision and, and AI uh, with w what are mostly feed-forward neural networks, which raises the interesting question as we're discussing as to what, what is the feedback for. Uh, we know in, 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 in vision uh, from, you know, several decades of, of, uh, of visual neuroscience work uh, that there are many other functions or computations that are required for our everyday kind of visual recognition tasks things like working memory, mm -hmm. uh, things like attention, uh, among many other things. And so, uh, you know, I do not necessarily have evidence at that very moment that incorporating uh, working memory or, or attention or the kinds of gating mechanisms that we know are taking place and, and routing uh, visual information in our visual system are, are required for the next generation of, of computer vision algorithms. But if I had to put my money on a kind mm -hmm. of next... Uh, 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 important direction for research, I would probably put my money on some of those functions. Uh, I see. So things for which we know humans uh, and, and primates more generally uh, uh, seem to leverage for, for certain visual recognition tasks. Mm -hmm. So it seems that you want to really like expand the tasks that deep need to do. Do you think that it's worth also trying to change some other um, biological constraints, like for example, changing the learning rule because it's not, you know, biological or tra training the visual diet of images that we give to these networks to train, um, or you know, some architectural stuff if beyond the um, recurrence. I don't know, like topography or some yeah, of course. brain anatomy inspired things. Yeah, Do you I think it's I, important I, or task. I, 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 I think it's fully important. In fact, you know, my PhD thesis was really about uh, taking, uh, you know, uh, building on earlier work on, uh, you know, trying to extend a model that was, you know, somewhat loosely 
constrained by anatomical and physiological data to make it more closely uh, consistent with you know the anatomy and the physiology of the visual system. I literally spent, I think, to three years of my life, uh, uh, literally reading as much uh, uh, monkey electrophysiology or mammalian electrophysiology papers that I could find uh, towards coming up with uh, you know uh, uh, some kinds of physiological wiring constraints as you would put them, architectural constraints, constraining receptive field sizes to be of a certain size so that they could closely mimic the you know, receptive field sizes in corresponding brain area, constraining the uh, uh, pooling in our you know, uh, uh, convolutional neural network so that we could uh, model uh, quantitatively uh, the receptive field size of simple and complex cells and in various brain areas, and et cetera. So yes, I think those things do matter. Uh, sadly, you know, I have to... to, to uh, uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, uh, today the it, it seems as if those uh, you know but by considering uh, uh, computer vision systems uh, optimized for image categorization that do not have any constraint uh, from biology or very limited at least quantitative constraint uh, those those uh, uh, models seem to be feeding experimental data you know monkey electrophysiology data pretty well so I would say you know this, the the jury is still out. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how much adding those constraints will uh, be needed both to a better account for neural responses in, in, in the visual cortex and to perhaps to, you know, uh, again, uh, lead the next generation of, of, of uh, computer vision architectures. But I think you made, you know, excellent points. I think, you know, we, you know, m most visual neuroscientists would agree that uh, uh, our visual diet and the way babies learn is, is very different from um, the way our computer vision algorithms learn, right? So we're not just being flashed with random, you know, IID uh, samples and, and class labels, but uh, uh, for one thing, we have access to a much richer visual world where uh, multiple cues are available to us to, say, uh, uh, parse figure from ground uh, to uh, be able to uh, uh, get better estimates of the surface properties of objects and, and things of that sort, which are uh, potentially very hard for modern neural network to, to learn simply because of the very impoverished uh, visual diet, as you put it, that we feed to them. And so in that sense, I think, uh, yes, there is a lot to be learned from, 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 uh, from development, from neuroscience. Um, I think it is, uh, you know, uh, up to us neuroscientists, computational neuroscientists to, uh, to, 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 you know, be able to make those, uh, 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 claims a little bit, you know, uh, to make sure that those claims are backed up by, by actual data, meaning, you know, showing that we can beat the state of the art by taking some of those mm -hmm. constraints into consideration. Not true. You mentioned that DeepNet predicts a lot of uh, data, and that's definitely true. But also, your work um, pointed out that some problems with deep learning, right? You were like comparing the I would, features. I, in fact, I would say this yeah. is most of what we do is to try to break <laughs> the state of the art to, to pinpoint yeah, to the yeah, limitation. Yeah, exactly. So, do you think that? We just need to have our model group being deep net and just fine tune them as you were also showing in your work and making the features that they are sensitive to kind of more similar to the human ones. Or maybe we need to start thinking about like some other model class that is not, you know, deep learning, but something else. Or do you think that we can just fine tune deep nets and then we can explain full brain representations? I think a little bit of both. I mean, I think it's hard, you know, given what we know about neuroscience, Again, uh, we have to remember that those deep convolutional neural networks are grounded in you know, visual neuroscience. Uh, and so today, they are still the best models we have available. W whether those models will you know, uh, pass the test of, of time, I, I don't know. But at the moment, it's hard to imagine a model of the visual system or the brain that would not involve some form of you know, deep learning or at least you know, a deep neural network. Mm -hmm. uh, they are probably not as deep as our uh, uh, modern deep neural network. We know, for one thing, that there are, our, our visual system is much shallower than the hundreds of, of processing uh, layer of processing that are found in our modern architecture. But you know, it, it's hard for me to imagine a, a, uh, a final, uh, ultimate model that would not involve some some kind of neural network fit for a neural network. Now, we also know that those models are not sufficient. You know, we've been discussing the fact that you know uh, we need to take into account feedback. There's a growing body of of literature suggesting that feedback is needed uh, uh, to better model and account for uh, the neural uh, responses uh, along the ventral stream. Um, we and others have started to 
point to key limitations uh, uh, for the state of, you know, in, in certain visual tasks that are uh, easy uh, for uh, humans and hard for deep neural networks. I should point out that what I mean by hard is that uh, they, you know, we have universal approximators, so they can learn any, any arbitrary mapping from input to output, uh, but uh, for certain tasks, they might uh, require uh, a very, very large number of training mm. examples, orders of magnitude more than uh, what humans and babies would potentially need. So, yeah. so regarding your question about what's, what's missing mm -hmm. uh, to, to uh, get the next generation of uh, 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 smart seeing machines or brain models, um, you know, I think you, you hit uh, all the, the, the right points. Uh, I think it's going to be a combination of uh, uh, additional computations that are mm -hmm. currently lacking in those architectures. So we, we've discussed working memory, attention, uh, even though, of course, there's a, a, an increasing uh, realization that attention actually is, is important, even in, in computer vision. Um, uh, it's going to be ways to better approximate, uh, uh, or at least ways to... Uh, uh, improve the way those algorithms are being trained. So I think you, you, you mentioned uh, one way to help deep neural networks is potentially by leveraging um, human supervision, for instance, by instructing deep networks to care about certain parts or certain uh, object features when they are mm -hmm. trained. Uh, those same object features that uh, are deemed or seem to be important for human subjects. Um, so I think it's going to be a combination of a lot of things. Uh, it's going to be extending what we have changing the visual diet of those algorithms. Uh, and perhaps, you know, in the long run, it's going to be uh, rethinking entirely the class of models that we are considering. Um, but it's hard to envision that, you know, at the moment, given the, I would say, overwhelming uh, evidence uh, from, computation, from neuroscience that, you know, you know th those architectures bear at least some uh, level of realism and, 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 and resemblance to uh, biological neural networks. Yeah. And so it seems that in vision we are kind of going in the right direction, but what are some other domains that you think we are really far from reaching human level intelligence? Yeah, so I mean, you know, you see in vision, I would say in, in image categorization, you mm -hmm. know, so uh, in fact, you know, there was a study I think published just last year showing that uh, the state of the art in say facial recognition is actually not just matching you and I uh, in our ability to recognize faces, but it's on par with the very best humans we have, the facial forensic experts. So. To me, this is a, you know, outstanding progress in the mm -hmm. field. Uh, so I would say, you know, uh, many would claim that image categorization has been solved. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, when uh, you push the systems uh, uh, beyond, you know, uh, uh, computer vision uh, kind of benchmarks, uh, you start, you know, things uh, 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 falling apart a little bit. And so what I mean by this is one example. Uh, in the in the realm, for actually one example, uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so you know, I, I have to confess that just a few years ago, I would tell my family, you know, over a casual conversation over the family table, that uh, they should expect self-driving car within a, a few years. Uh, I'm no longer convinced that this is the case, mm -hmm. and and I think we're seeing the limit of the current learning paradigm in the sense that we have algorithms that are uh, uh, very good at. Uh, uh, storing a large number of, of, uh, of training examples, uh, but there is, uh, I think, some uh, uh, amount of evidence that there is not a lot of uh, generalization beyond training data. And so what I mean by this is that, you know, the, the world is essentially, uh, our visual world is uh, uh, completely open-ended, and so there is no way that uh, we're going to be exposed to all possible uh, image degradations that could be uh, applied to, uh, you know, pictures of pedestrians or cars or street scenes and things of that sort. Um, uh, however, we know that uh, at the moment, uh, the state of the art in computer vision uh, is able to be trained on specific type of image degradation. So I can apply a very specific kind of noise on images that are used to train this neural network. And then they'll be able to recognize pedestrians and cars much better than you and I uh, with levels of degradations that actually make recognition impossible for us. And yet, it is also known that if we make a tiny amount of change in the type of noise applied um, uh, to, the, say, the test data, I go from a salt and pepper type of noise, mm -hmm. if you've played with Photoshop, to a Gaussian type of noise, uh, and suddenly the accuracy of these uh, algorithms uh, collapses. And so these algorithms are able to essentially uh, generalize to image degradations that they were trained with, but uh, so far there is no evidence that they can truly generalized to image degradations that they've never seen before. 
this is a point that Pavancina here in BCS made, you know, yeah. when, I, when I trained here some uh, 70 years ago, that one of the hallmarks of, of uh, uh, human vision is uh, this uncanny ability that we have to, to deal with, you know, potentially image degradations that we were never exposed to before. And so I think that that's really where the challenge is for, for deep learning, dealing with the unknown and the unseen. Uh, and I think, you know, the fact that we don't have self-driving cars reflect the fact that, you know, we can keep driving millions of miles around the country, uh, try to find those edge cases, those weird illumination, those weird weather conditions, those weird specular highlights. Um, we will never, you know, we will never run out of, of edge cases. And so we're going to be driving those cars around uh, potentially forever unless we, we, we come up with a better uh, uh, solution. Mm -hmm, that's true. And as many young researchers may be watching this uh, interview, so do you have any advice to close for the people in this field um, in terms of how they, what they should think of in terms of next questions and kind of fruitful career in this field? Yeah, I would, I would you know, tell them to uh, study vision. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I know that I'm going to sound like an old fart, but, you know, I, it, it, um, I find it shocking to attend computer vision conferences and, and, and uh, talk to brilliant, you know, uh, young uh, researchers who know a lot about, you know, deep learning, about the latest library to implement their algorithms, about all kinds of tricks and heuristics to get this very deep neural network to, to learn anything at all. Uh, but often I'm, I'm baffled by uh, how much the kind of classical training uh, in computer vision has kind of, uh, uh, you know, been forgotten and, and, and often is, is missing from, uh, you know, general computer science or even uh, uh, AI kind of training and so I would tell students to go back to classic classic computer vision training understanding you know the mathematical processes behind vision I would tell them to go back to uh, visual perception uh, to go back to uh, uh, some of the points that are mentors you know were making already in the 50s and 60s about uh, what makes human vision so so much better than just sheer template matching and kind of brute force template matching and i think you know we need more people uh, uh, studying uh, and working in the area of deep learning uh, which approach the problem from a cognitive psychology or visual neuroscience perspective uh, with the idea of understanding uh, what's happening in the, in the, in the, in the system uh, and, and really probing, you know, not necessarily focusing on, 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 on pushing benchmarks and pushing the state of the art by a few percent, but really tackling the hard problems, figuring out, you know, the edge cases, uh, what are the things that are easy or hard for those networks to learn and how those compares to humans' ability to learn. Um, Thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to talk with you. And Thomas will give a, a talk later today and so you can see it at the CBMM channel. And thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Thank you.